Okay, so we are recording. We are now beginning. Welcome everyone to the second uh, meeting of the Philosophy Speaker Series at Royal Holloway this year. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for um, this meeting. It's uh, T. Nguyen from the University of Utah, uh, where he is um, associate professor, I believe. Yep. Yep. Um, T. works on trust and art and games and communities. And uh, as we were just saying before starting the recording, he's the author of a book called Games Agency as Art. Um, which has just uh, won the APA 2021 uh, Book Prize. So we're really excited to have him here. Uh, we're going to be listening to a talk called uh, Transparency is Surveillance. And uh, I guess I'll just give it over to you, T. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Okay. So I, by the way, I'm doing a weird, to explain, I, I should say two things about my situation as you see my eyes wander. So the thing I hate the most about Teams is once I start my PowerPoint, I can't see anyone's faces, but I figured out a hack. And the hack is that over here, I have my iPad also logged in as T-Drone. So I can actually see your faces. So right now I can actually see one face. And I found that if I can see at least one face, then I give three times of a better talk because um, just, yeah, thank you for uh, just having nothing but talking into a screen is just nothingness but that means that when i'm looking over here i'm actually making eye contact with you which is the weirdness the other thing um i just have to because this is this is the zoom era this is hysterical so i'm in my dark basement at 7 a.m it's totally dark uh there's a window out here that faces my neighbor's basement to which there's a huge window and it's just total darkness except my neighbor has just fired up on his enormous screen tv frozen which i'm sure is because his children are awake and my children love frozen too so this is going to be a willpower struggle to not hear those songs in my head because that's literally floating above my screen as i do this it's just like zoom era weirdness okay uh um... Yes, this works. You can actually, I can see faces over here. This is awesome. Okay, so uh, really tiny, but you're there. Um, so this is a talk that, um, this is a talk, uh, so this is gonna be a talk about transparency and metrics, but this research direction actually started in this James book that Anthony and I were just talking about. So I spent like seven years of my life doing a project in the philosophy of games. And most of uh, my recent book, Games Agency is Art, is about it's kind of like a love song in praise of games. And it's mostly about game aesthetics and how games offer this amazing experience of temporary clarity where you know exactly what you're doing and you know exactly your purpose. Um, and the end of the book ended up as a short critique of gamification. Uh, things like Fitbit, Twitter, um, various. Uh, and I was really interested in the way that intentional and unintentional gamification seeped into our uh, motivational set. I was, so I was, I got, became, it, there's this concept called value capture that I introduced in that chapter. And value capture is what happens when you enter into a terrain where your values start or developing towards something rich and subtle. And that terrain gives you some simple, typically quantified metric of success, uh, likes on Twitter, right? Citation rates. And then that simple metric become, starts to dominate your practical reasoning. Like, I don't know, you go into philosophy of graduate school for the love of truth and you come out obsessed with the placement of your articles on some ranked list of the statuses of journals, right? So that's value capture. So that got introduced in the book um, and I've been obsessed with it. I've been working on that topic uh, for the three years since the games book came out. And this paper that you're about to see uh, started as a footnote in a paper about value capture and then grew to dwarf the rest of the paper. So it is spun off on its own. I should also say that this paper has just come out already in PPR, but it's also, I'm, I'm giving this because it's clearly on the way, all this material is on its way towards a book. So I'm still, I feel like what I figured out in the paper, I'm, uh, talk and paper I'm going to give you is just like a first step. And so uh, the world is open and I'm still trying to figure stuff out. Okay, so this is a paper about this notion of public transparency. But public transparency is the idea that you should make various things from institutions available publicly to, so, right, you know what transparency is. 
So in our world, transparency tends to be treated as a pure good. Um, and I've always worried a little about this. And then I found when I was reading Onara O'Neill's wonderful BBC Rights Lectures on Trust, I found this paragraph uh, in that paper. Uh, so this is what O'Neill says. Transparency can encourage people to be less honest, still increasing deception and reducing reasons for trust. Those who know that everything they say are right is to be made public may massage the truth. Public reports may underplay sensitive information. Head teachers and employers may write blandly uninformative reports and references. Evasive and uninformative statements may substitute for truth telling. Demands for universal transparency are likely to encourage the evasions, hypocrisies, and half truths that we usually refer to as political correctness, but which might more forthrightly be called self censorship or deception. Um, I found this argument really striking. So it struck me as really obviously getting at something deeply true, but also strangely, I'd like never quite heard anything, anyone articulate anything like this, even though in my academic administrative career, I feel this constantly. I, I should say this right now. Um, this paper partially, uh, uh, this paper is partially an act of like therapy and recovery. I spent six years as the, uh, Department liaison in charge of quantitative educational learning outcomes assessment, uh, proving to the Utah legislature that we were, were actually educating our students. And so I've been right on, I think most of us have been on both sides of the transparency spectrum. So this looks really, really deeply right to me. And I don't see a lot of people talking about this. And interestingly, in the social epistemology world that I travel in, I haven't seen people talking about this passage. And this is, by the way, a really short passage from. Uh, a longer lecture series by Anara O'Neill. So I want, I think this argument is under recognized and underappreciated. So I want to explicate it, I want to defend it, and I want to worsen the conclusion actually, because I think uh, things are even worse than O'Neill thinks. So to simplify and emphasize one part of the argument, here's, here's the thread that I'm going to draw from O'Neill's paragraph. So people think that trust and transparency go together, but they're actually at odds because transparency demands that experts justify their reasoning to non-experts. But expert reasons are incomprehensible to non-experts, so transparency forces deception. This is me reading what I think to be this, ex so I think expertise is everywhere, but relatively implicit in the O'Neill passage, and I'm just trying to bring it to the fore. But then I wanna add something. So O'Neill's worry is specifically that transparency forces experts to conceal their real reasons and to invent new fake reasons for public consumption. That is that it forces deception. So my worry is that in some cases, not all, you'll get something even worse, which is that transparency will confine experts to non-expert available reasons. That is that experts, so O'Neill's worry is that the experts won't change their actions. They'll just lie about why they're doing it. My worry is that for various reasons that I'm gonna to try to discuss, Experts will change their actions to those for which there are non-expert available reasons. And to that extent, transparency actually undermines expert action. So um, it's useful to do a bunch of case studies. Uh, so here's one, this one I admit is kind of brutally simple, but it's a good place to start. So there's something called Charity Navigator and Charity Navigator is an oversight website and organization for various charities. Actually, I, I used to use this all the time. I would teach like singer and effective altruism and intro ethics. And then I would have the class donate like 20 bucks of my money and we'd go on Charity Navigator, we'd do all this stuff. So Charity Navigator ranks charities based on transparency, accountability and effectiveness. And it ends up using one, most of the biggest part of the score is determined by one, uh, factor, which is throughput, which is the more money, the, 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 the throughput is the percentage of contributed money sent to that nonprofit that gets through to the target. So that more money that's sent through and not used by the organization, the higher the rating. So the idea is that you want to reduce administrative waste and internal overhead. So it turns out, if you actually talk to experts in the nonprofit charity realm, beyond a certain point, this is a terrible metric because it forces nonprofits to cut internal administrative costs and operate on a shoestring. Imagine, for example, if your department was ranked by how little it spent internally on employees and operation, right? And the, the departments in university were ranked and awarded budgets based on how little they spent, right? I mean, at some point, you're screwed. So, so charities right now are being forced to operate with painfully thin budgets in order to get a good rank on Charity Navigator because so much 
of the public is using Charity Navigator as a way to determine where to send their charitable uh, donations. Second case study, Sally Engelmary's wonderful book, The Seductions of Quantification. So Sally Engelmary is an anthropologist, and she actually ended up, uh, she, she specializes in human rights, and she ended up sitting on a lot of UN committees, creating the very indice, various indices of human rights, like the Global Development Index, the GDI, that ranks countries on how well they support human development. So in this book, she kind of turns her anthropologist's eye at the UN committees, and she kind of shows you how the UN sausage is made, and uh, and it's uh, it's revolting. Actually, so here's an example from her book that I found really striking. She spends two chapters talking about the, st the U.S. State Department's sex trafficking in index, which rates countries based on how well they're doing to reduce sex trafficking. In sex trafficking. So this index actually comes from the U.S. State Department, not the U.N., and it comes from the State Department, which has, Mary says, a very policing law and order mindset. So the index rates countries solely based on the number of convictions of sex traffickers. But she says, notice the policing approach isn't the only available approach. So... Here's what she ends up saying. Look, here's another way to reduce sex trafficking in an area. Sex trafficking is highly correlated with poverty and starvation. If you reduce ambient poverty, then sex trafficking goes away on its own, right? People aren't motivated to enter sex trafficking. But if you reduce poverty, convictions of sex traffickers reduce because the number of sex traffickers just uh, just evaporates for, uh, for economic reasons. So if you reduce sex trafficking through economic measures of poverty control, then the sex trafficking in index will say that you have done worse, that you're failing to control sex trafficking. Does that make sense? So it incentivizes things towards a policing approach rather than economic approach. So in all these cases, there are things that apparently look like good metrics for performance, which seem to make sense to non-experts, but turn out to be, in the eyes of experts, a blunt and inaccurate instrument. So transparency forces experts to be ruled by metrics that are comprehensible to non-experts. By the way, the forces here is going to vary. One of the things I want to talk about is the various degrees that transparency can be intrusive or not. So that's the forces there is going to be a spectrum concept. And transparency can draw experts to reason sometimes using metrics. And so far, insofar as they reason using the metrics, not just use them for reporting, but use them for their internal reasoning, then that'll significantly undermine their degree of expertise. Um, third case study. This is this is this is for my life. This is uh, my experience with education in the United States. So here's some metrics currently being used in higher administration and higher ed governance: uh, graduation rate, graduation speed, employment rate, and income of recently graduated students, and student satisfaction is reported on evaluations. By the way, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. But if you're interested in a really good look. At an empirical look at the metrics being used in higher ed, I really recommend Wendy Esplin's work, especially her book uh, with uh, Ed Souter, which is called Engines of Anxiety. Um, and that's a study of the impact of the law school rankings from the US News and World Report on law school culture. Anyway, so at my last university, as I was leaving my last university, uh, where I had this job in uh, outcomes assessment, um, Things were moving in the following direction. We were moving towards having to justify every budgetary outcome in terms of evidence of students that it supports student success, where student success was formally defined as a weighted aggregate of graduation rate and graduation speed and nothing else. Right. Uh, and I, I just want to note, notice that's a very quick and usable and apparently objective measure that anyone can understand. Right. Serious things are rarely assessed in higher ed right now. Increasing thoughtfulness, increasing self-reflection, increasing virtue, and increasing humility. And these are, I, and I think the reason is, and these are because these are all for reasons I'm going to give during this talk, uh, difficult to access in the world of institutionally available objective metrics and measures. So the worry, and the worry throughout this whole project I'm trying, I'm trying to do right now, is I'm worried that for institutional reasons, we're being pushed to target things like graduation rate and graduation speed and pushed away from targeting things like thoughtfulness, self-reflection, and virtue in education because these kinds of things are easy to measure in an institutional context and these kinds of things are hard to measure in an institutional context. Now, as you just note here, as I'm talking about this difficulty to measure, in no way am I making some point about 
the ability to quantify these things in principle. What I'm interested in is the typical quantifications that we'll find in institutional settings, given large scale institutional pressures, which, uh, which are really well documented in the empirical literature. Okay, so that's, that's the overview of what we're gonna talk about. So uh, into the argument. So I'm gonna define transparency as a directive that some process be available for assessment to outsiders. So there are two forms of transparency. Um, one is expert transparency, which is that a process by one set of experts to be made accessible to others possessing the same expertise. For example, epidemiologists making their data sets available to other epidemiologists to check. Um, the other is public transparency, which is that a process be made accessible to the general public or their representatives. I'm gonna focus on public transparency. I'm gonna talk a little bit about expert transparency, but I think the major problems that O'Neill's argument highlights are for public transparency. So public transparency is that a process be made available for assessment by the general public or their representatives. Available here is supposed to be meant robustly. So that means the process is expressed in terms that are comprehensible to the general public. So what I mean is if you are an epidemiologist and you just dump your spreadsheet online, and the spreadsheets involve all kinds of technical jargon, incomprehensible data, that doesn't count as public transparency. The public can't use that for assessment, right? There needs to be some kind of, some translation or finding some metric which the public can understand to count as being made available to the public for assessment. And here's the thing I wanna say. The, the main claim of this paper is not that transparency is bad and we should get used to it, uh, get rid of it. The claim is that transparency is intended to and definitely does succeed in curtailing bias and corruption. And in fact, is one of our best means for curtailing bias and corruption. But there's also a major downside. So generally, I feel like the drift of institutional culture right now is in the direction of the more transparency, the better. Right? Transparency is unquestioned good, which we should maximize. My claim is going to be that transparency is a form of aggressive surveillance. And it's very valuable and it's very costly at the same time. And it should be used judiciously. So here's, I'm going to give you two versions of the argument. Uh, the main one I'm going to focus on is the expertise version. So here's the master argument for the paper. Um, one, expertise often requires acting from reasons that are not available to non-experts. So I take this to be completely obvious, right? Any sensible account of expertise supports premise one. And there are two ways that this happens. One is that there's some kinds of explicit reasoning that require training or specialized knowledge, right? You can't read a logic proof without having some training in logic. But I think the really interesting one especially for our purposes, is tacit knowledge. Um, so, of course, there's a long philosophical tradition of talking about uh, uh, tacit knowledge uh, that most recently starts with Dreyfus. Recent work by Ellen Fridland and Matt Stichter, I think, is pushing this in a really useful direction. Uh, but basically, a lot of expertise shows up as skilled per uh, perception or informed intuition. So a lot of the famous cases from Dreyfus are things like a doctor can just walk into a waiting room and look around and children that are very sick just look sick to them right immediately my version of this is i feel like the more i teach lecture classes of 200 the more i can just have an immediate reading of the room to know whether people are with me or against me or whether i'm losing them or whether they're pissed off like that that's not that's not explicit deductive reasoning that's just it feels to me like an immediate synthetic perception that's been trained through expertise so, two, public transparency on expert processes demands that experts take only those actions for which they can give public justification, which limits them to actions that can be justified in non-expert terms. So in some sense, this master argument is something I take to be really simple. It's just, if you have a basic understanding of what expertise is and a basic understanding of what public transparency is, their intention, right? Expertise involves reasonings that aren't available to the public, and public transparency involves putting experts under the thumb to some degree of justifications that are available to the public. So, by the way, the argument here uh, is, not, uh, is not just that there are some examples of bad metrics. It's that the essential logic of transparency, which is offering justifications that are available to everyone, is in tension with expertise. So I want to say uh, the, non, the expert non-expert distinction for me is not a simple binary classification. So it's not... so. Uh, there's an old 
political philosophy argument um, that something like, look, there's a class of experts and they should rule everyone else. This has been discredited. The claim here is not that there's some class that is the experts. The claim is that the current world is so hyper-specialized that most of us are non-experts in almost everything, even if we're experts in one thing. I mean, we know, we know this in philosophy, right? I study aesthetics and social epistemology. Like, I know nothing. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at Anthony Bruno here. Like, everything he's expert in, I can't even read those papers, right? And that's just, like, right next door, let alone, say, my, my wife is now working in the office next to me many days. She's a chemist. And, like, you know, you've had, probably had this experience. I look at what she's working on. It's just, like, hieroglyphic garbage to me. They're just it, it is incomprehensible. So the claim is not there's some particular elite class that's better. It's that everybody is an, everybody is an expert, an expert in most things. So aggregating as an aggregate, the body of us is an expert in most things. So how much does transparency undermine expertise? It's going to depend. And what I wanted to kind of do here is give a taxonomy and a set of like variables about how much uh, transparency can undermine expertise. So there are two loci for transparency assessment. So you could justify, you could assess a expert process in two places, in the outputs or the deliberation, right? So um, output transparency, some examples, would look like, say, assessing doctors on lives saved or assessing police on cases closed. Deliberative transparency would be like assessing doctors based on their justification for prescribing particular drugs in terms of specified diagnostic criteria or assessing particular budgetary requests for a department in terms of data-driven demonstrations of the efficacy of those requests. So the output transparency demands that experts give justifications in terms of monitorable outputs. And this actually is less intrusive, I think. This gives relatively more leeway to deliberations about particular actions. So you still have to hit the targets, but the sub-decisions about how to hit the targets are screened from public oversight. So for example, um, if output transparency is in graduation rate or student evaluations, at least that transparency is confined to a singular output at the end of the process. Deliberative transparency it gives us a lot less leeway. So deliberative transparency is much more intrusive. Output transparency limits expertise about the final target selection and binds targets to binds experts to targets that non-experts can understand. Deliberative transparency binds the reasoning process and is so much more intrusive. By the way, if you look at the history of transparency, we tend to be moving from output transparency more and more in the direction of deliberative transparency. Not always, but it, deliberative transparency demands are becoming much more common. So Neil's assumption is that experts will always act the same as, but invent, will act the same as always, but invent false justifications. I think there are two worst possibilities. I want to call them limitation and guidance. Limitation is that experts will limit their actions to those for which they can find some public justification. And guidance is experts will seek or publicly prefer publicly available reasons in their own deliberations on how to act. So an example of one, limitation. Limitation looks like this. So we're going to teach philosophy in the exact... So I was in charge of assessment for a while. We're going to teach philosophy in exactly the same way. And I looked for some justification that would justify what we were doing. And it turned out that that justification could be showing that our students did better on the law school exam, the LSATs, right? So that's, we found that justification after we took our action. But if you accept that as the justification, it turns out that that justification starts to limit your action. So because some kinds of classes, like logic classes, do really well at hitting that target, and other kinds of classes, more poetic classes in, uh, in the more romantic parts of philosophy, don't do as well in hitting that target. So in limitation cases, the public justification still confines the actions to something for which you can find some public justification. Guidance cases are cases where experts actually start seeking or using publicly available reasons primarily in their action. Um, so limiting transparency, for example, doctors might be sued unless they can find some plausible diagnosis to attach a prescription to. So they'll only prescribe, they'll, consider a range of possible prescriptions and then pick the one that they can find some plausible diagnosis, even if that's not their reason, even if their reasoning is something like gut instinct. By the way, I have friends who are psychiatrists and I asked them how often they do this. And one of my friends said, 90% of the time, this is what I'm doing. I'm using my gut to 
figure out what I should prescribe, and then I'm finding a diagnosis uh, that can support it. So guiding transparency is going to look more like this, rewarding or funding university departments based on graduation speed rather than some harder measure quality, or these, these are real world cases, rewarding police chiefs with higher salaries for higher case closure rates, or rewarding nonprofits with better, uh, better things with higher donations, or rewarding principals and teachers for higher student performance on standardized tests. Each of these will, bring, will change action, because in these cases at least, uh, people are being incentivized to hit the target that's publicly comprehensible. So and I think there are two kinds of guidance transparency. One is, the kind, I've just given you some easy examples of incentivized guidance, where the demand for transparency generates simplified metrics, and then we attach success on those metrics to a reward, which can offer some pressure and expert motivation. Um, so notice, again, they're not just finding plausible cover. They're actually changing to target the incentive. The most Intrusive form, though, for me is internalized guidance, which is in the demand for transparency generates simplified metrics, which experts internalize as the basis for their practical reasoning. If experts actually accept some external metric as what they actually care about, rather than simply an incentive, uh, and what this look like, look like, for example, is a researcher that starts to target things that will give them high citation rates. Or I hear in England you have. I think it's called ref factor. I think if you start targeting ref factor primarily, right, as what you care about, then that's internalized guidance. Um, so guidance, guidance, guiding transparency is even worse if you shift from incentives to internalization. So consider this capture of val this phenomenon of value capture that I talked about earlier, which is when you start with subtle personalized values and you enter a social situation that presents you with simplified versions of values and those come to dominate your practical reasoning. Um, examples that I think are well documented, GPA, Fitbit, Twitter, citation rates, money, law school rankings. Um, there's really good documentation of this, especially in the sociology and anthropology literature. But again, I want to really highly recommend this book, Engines of Anxiety by Wendy Esplin and Michael Souter, who are uh, sociologists. And this book is um, the result of a 10-year empirical study on what happened when the US News and World Report law school rankings started getting published. And one of the things they say that's so interesting is first that, um, whoops, sorry. Uh, first that, so they say before the law school rankings, there weren't, there wasn't actually any ranked list of law schools. There were, um, there were quantitative description, sorry, qualitative descriptions of different universities and their missions. Um, and What's interesting, they say, is that institutions at that time used to have very different missions that they pursued aggressively. So some were much in, more interested in corporate jobs or in theory and academics. Others were interested in supporting the local community or serving underrepresented minorities. Um, but many of those missions aren't measured by the U.S. News and World Report rankings. And so schools that, per, that pursued, for example, social justice missions would find that they plunged in the rankings. And so U.S. News and World Report law school rankings ended up incentivizing and essentially forcing all law schools to realign their, uh, their internal targets to what only what was measured by the US News and World Report law school rankings. By the way, if you think this is an exaggeration, read this book. It's extremely well documented and it's horrifying. But that so far is just a case of incentivization. That's an internalization case. But they, one of the things they document, and there's a chapter about this, which I just find remarkable, um, is that the US News and World Report, that, that before the US News and World Report, students prospective law school students would try to decide what law school to go to, and this would trigger a process of value deliberation where the students would try to figure out what they cared about about their law school, um, about their law school education. Uh, basically, the plurality of values represented by different law schools would trigger a process of internal value deliberation. And what Espen Sauter say is, once the US News and World Report starts issuing law school rankings, students stop value deliberating. Instead, they seem to take it as a given that their goal is to get into the best school and the law school ranking set what best is, right? So this is a case, I think, of an internalization. This is a value capture case for me. By the way, in this other paper, the, the current paper is a spinoff of, I try to argue that this counts as 
outsourcing your value deliberation and then it's autonomy undermining. We can talk about that if you want. That's that's a different paper. Um, so yeah, that's like a different book. Okay, so um, by the way, Anthony, thank you for smiling and nodding vigorously. You're like a box the size of my thumb, and it's really it's really helping me out right now. Um, it's helping me not pay attention to Frozen. Uh, so here's here's the general claim: limitation constrains expertise, incentivized guidance undermines expertise, and internalized guidance profoundly undermines expertise. And the spectrum of undermining expertise here concerns how much of the expert's reasoning is tied to the demand that those reasons be made available to non-experts. Um, in particular, if you think about that, oh, the, the most intrusive thing here would be internalized deliberative guidance. That is, if you internalize the demand, not just to hit a target that's publicly available, that all your reasoning along the way be publicly available. And I don't think that's so uncommon. I think that's actually, for a lot of us, our experience of the face of bureaucracy, right? That is the experience of... Um, there's a, one of the things I'm trying to describe here is a kind of bureaucratized mindset, where the bureaucratized mindset is one to ask that all justifications be made in terms of available, explicitly stated policies that can be understood by anybody in the institution. And I think once you've internalized that demand, you've gotten to the most intrusive form of the thing I'm talking about, which is internalized deliberative guidance. Okay, so <clears throat> O'Neill's deception out, uh, account lets you have an enormous amount of leeway. The experts will take the same actions under transparency, they just have to invent alternate public reasons. And I think that depends in part on ineffective monitoring and a lack of a link between incentives and metrics. And so O'Neill was writing uh, this, a lot of her work was done in the 90s as she was working in bioethics. And I think the situation of transparency for doctors in the 90s did have, offer a huge amount of leeway. But when you shift to transparency regimes or that offer less leeway, you lose that possibility. So for example, in my last university, so here's a simple example. A lot of doctors in O'Neill's case don't have to record any of the data officially. They can just look at the patient, make up an alternate diagnosis and write down that diagnosis. They were responsible for data collection. It was wet, right? On the other hand, in my university, we had to hit the target of student uh, graduation rate and speed. That's not fudgeable because a different department collects that data, right? So we have less leeway. Um, same is true for things like the charity navigator throughput ratings. So here's the basic problem. Transparent metrics can't capture expert valuing and reasoning. And the less leeway there is, the more metrics push out expertise. Okay, that's the master argument from expertise. Here's the second argument. I'm going to admit this is a bit of a stub. This is really a promissory note for a future paper that might be even more interesting. So here's the thought. This is the argument from intimate reasons, which is a variation of the argument from expertise. This may actually be the same argument in different terms. I actually don't know yet, so you can tell me what you think. So um, longstanding communities develop shared reasons that aren't available to those outside the community. Call these intimate reasons. Two, properly assessing intimate reasons often requires long familiarity with a particular context or a long history of shared communal deliberation. Three, both expert transparency and public transparency undermine our capacity to use these shared intimate developed reasoning. So transparency undermines the intimate reasoning of communities. So some examples of intimate reasons, a philosopher's sense of interesting questions, an aesthetic sense of good flow and rap, the sense of cool and skateboard tricks, a game designer's discussion of friction in games. So those are all aesthetic examples, you might think, or sensitivity examples. Here's another one. An oppressed community's sense of what uses of terms are and aren't demeaning, or an oppressed community's sense of what acts of cultural appropriation are and aren't permissible. So why might there be intimate reasons? So some reasons are convincing only to those who have had a specific experience. Um, by the way, Kyla ebels duggan offers a really good argument for this in Beyond Words, but she tends to focus on the individual case, right? And I, I think that argument, if you think that there are some reasons are only convincing you've had a specific experience, and you think some experiences are non-universal but shared across the community, like, say, living under a particular kind of oppression, then this, should, then this generalizes to show not just that there are totally private reasons, but there are intimate reasons to a community. And so intimate reasons would exist for those whose, where those specific experiences are shared but not universal, like living under a racism or another form of oppression, or 
aesthetic reasons that come from having felt the grip of a particular style, like the joys of improv jazz or Wagner or Wu Tang's weird flow. Um, so I think it's really important here that when people think about transparency, they typically think about transparency by a good and competent public over a corrupt political figure. But a lot of the times it's reversed. A lot of the times you have transparency over a well-intentioned minority advocacy group by an insensitive set of public representatives or a rushed public. So one of the reasons, I mean, this is a bit autobiographical. So I teach in Utah, and a lot of this paper comes from watching uh, my university's LBGTQ support and alliance group have budgetary transparency to the Utah, to a board of trustees in Utah, which was incredibly insensitive to LGBTQ issues, right? The whole point of stocking an LBGTQ alliance group with people from that community is that you think the people in the community have some special sensitivity, but the demand for transparency typically ends up overriding that. So I thought an entire debate about whether or not safe spaces were important and whether or not the group was allowed to set up safe spaces. It was very clear that the oversight committees didn't understand the experience, importance of safe spaces because they hadn't, there were no queer people in the board of trustees and oversight committee. Another way to put this is that, um, Okay, I mean, let me go back for a second. Here's what one of the things that's really interesting to me for the argument for intimate reasons. If you are, as I am, soaked in the academic world of progressives, liberals, and various people on the left, you'll notice that we have two, we are often committed to two things. One is the kind of beliefs that are loosely called standpoint epistemology, where people from a particular standpoint or community have more access to what's important. And the other is transparency. But what I'm trying to point out here is that standpoint epistemology and transparency are intention, right? That if you think there's a special sensitivity that you get from living under oppression, that's intention with demand that all of a group's actions be justifiable to the public in general, right? And I think that's a really interesting uh, tension inside liberal and left, standard liberal and left commitments. So here's a big view. There's a tension, so stepping back here. So the big view here is that there's a tension between transparency practices and the respect for expertise. So, I mean, I think the big picture here is that there's a standard of intellectual autonomy, um, which expects every person to evaluate for themselves every intellectual realm they come into contact with. And I think, I mean, I call this the Cartesian fantasy, and I think it should be obvious to us now that this is a fantasy. Um, and Elijah Milgram in his wonderful book, The Great and Darkman, which is about the epistemology, epistemology in the era of hyper-specialization. What he suggests is that this demand of intellectual autonomy is an outmoded principle that evolved in a time when the human sciences were much smaller, helped grow the human sciences, and has basically undermined itself by helping to create human sciences so large that we can't be intellectually autonomous anymore. Here's, and here's the biggest picture. This is the big, the white whale I'm actually chasing. Um, it's that there's something weird about the standard of public reason. That the demand that all reason should be accessible to anybody is in profound tension with both an understanding of expertise and with standpoint epistemology. Okay, um, so here's a response. Here's one objection to everything I've said. Doesn't the public have a right to control what they fund? And in particular, so let's, narrow down to publicly funded cases like scientific research, arts grants, academics of public schools. So Philip Kitcher has argued that there isn't a single clear value that should guide all science, like the pursuit of pure understanding. There's only different projects guided by different values. And insofar as the public funds science, they should set those values. So you're, I'm imagining an, object, an opponent here saying, OK, T, let's accept what you've said and we should get rid of deliberative transparency. But can't we keep outcome transparency? Doctors use all kinds of complex reasoning, but the outcome is health. So. We expertise should be applied to the means, but not the ends. And the experts, insofar as they're public funded, should be in service of the public's conception of the good. So let the public set the goals, let them set the output, have output transparency, nice middle ground. I think there's a major problem here. And that major problem comes from the presumption that the public has a good grasp of what the value, a perfect grasp of what the value is in the situation. So here's an example from Jennifer Lena's a wonderful book entitled. So Jennifer Lena is a sociologist of music and entitled is a study of public arts funding in America, which is 
amazing. And also convinced me that it's really weird that philosophy of art has never talked about public arts funding. <clears throat> so she says, when the National Endowment for the Arts was under the direct purview of Congress, Congress people accused the NEA of pork barreling and corruption because, and here's the justification, the NEA kept funding projects that didn't make a lot of money, right? And so they demanded the NEA prove they weren't corrupt by showing that they were largely funding things that made money. So the response should be, making money isn't the primary value in art, right? But I think it should be evident here that the primary value in art is something of an expert matter. It takes a lot of time and experience to see what the value is. Um, and, and if you have a demand for public transparency, there's a tendency for that to lead to default to a supposedly objective measure that everyone can access and understand, like making money. <clears throat> so the assumption behind the contra proposal that is that expertise is merely instrumental. The proper targets in a domain are available to non-experts. But I think what Lena's example suggests is that often expertise is required to see what's really valuable. Um, and I think a really useful background thought for me here comes from Tal Brewer's book, The Retrieval of Ethics, which I love and I think is also underread right now. And Tal Brewer's account is that it really takes long involvement with an activity to see its value. And part of expertise is getting a much more refined and full understanding of the value of that activity. I mean, for those of us in philosophy, this should be obvious. It's often hard to explain what the value of philosophy is to non-philosophers, including, say, deans from the business school and students that are deciding whether or not they need to take an intro ethics class, right? Um, so what do we do about this in cases of expert funding? <clears throat> so one possibility is what Skitcher suggests, which is that experts should set the desired outcome entirely. And hopefully what I've shown you is that that's problematic. But here's another possibility. The public sets the outcome vaguely, and then the expert fills out the precise nature of that outcome. So I want to call these, these one, the option I just described, I want to call value handoff. The public specifies the value in general, and the expert fills it out. And then there's direct output transparency. The public specifies the value and picks the metric by which the success is measured. And I think, hopefully, the arguments I've shown push in the direction of value handoff. So direct output transparency will work in those domains for which there's a clear litmus test. So this is an example I developed, this is an idea I developed in an early paper of mine, Cognitive Islands or Runaway Echo Chambers. And a litmus test is an assessment of an output that's available to non-experts. So I think non-experts might not be able to assess bridge engineering reasoning, but we can see whether bridges fall down. So bridge building seems to have a litmus test. But I'm worried that a lot of, uh, but even if you believe that, so first of all, I think a lot of domains don't have litmus tests. The arts, philosophy. But I think even if there is a litmus test, there's another problem of false litmus tests where the non-expert, due to their inexpertise, thinks they have a good litmus test and they're wrong. For example, charity navigators go through a put metric or the view that education is a value only if it leads to increased salary. A great example of this, I, I read a bunch of papers that debunked wine expertise because they, they had a bunch of tests that showed that Experts couldn't blindfolded, couldn't tell the difference between red wine and white wine. It turns out this is a terrible test because actually, if you know a lot about wine, there are a lot of red wines like cold country Pinot Noirs that are delicate and crisp. And there are a lot of white wines like big Californian oaky Chardonnays that are big and powerful and tannic. And the idea that an expert should be able to tell blindfolded between red wine and white wine is actually born of inexpertise. Another way to put it is that there might be a reliable test for experts, but direct output transparency requires that non-experts properly identify the litmus test. Which I think, so a lot of my interest in this came from being interested in the old problem of how the non-expert identifies the expert, the expert identification problem. And I think direct output transparency doesn't solve that problem. It just pushes it one step back. Instead of having the non-expert identify the expert, now you're having them identify the right test for the expert. But the same problem is there. If the non-expert is non-expert, how are they supposed to identify the right litmus test, right? Um, I mean, this is, <clears throat> in some sense, this entire uh, talk is a really, is working out the real implications of Dunning-Kruger. Like, if you don't, no terrain, you don't know how much you don't know. So you think you have a good litmus test, but you don't. And the second problem, which I think is even deeper and more philosophically interesting and intense, is that I'm worried about the magnetism of clear litmus tests, which is that activities might be reformulated around available litmus tests. So some worries. Uh, I mean, actually the simplest one is for me is, sometimes I give this talk and people are like, oh, but what about fitness? Like we're trying to lose weight and that's measurable. And my thought is, 
how did we get to the point where we thought fitness was about weight loss? And one suggestion is weight loss is more measurable than other more inchoate senses of well-being. And so we reformulated the activity in our minds. Other examples, I'm worried, this is actually, this is very contentious right now in the COVID era, but I'm worried that medicine has become more oriented towards measurable outcomes, like saving lives, increasing lifespan, and less over less measurable ones, like subtler measures of well-being. And that education has become more oriented towards measurable outcomes, like employment rates and satisfaction surveys, rather than less measurable ones like wisdom and the cultivation of intellectual virtue. Okay, <clears throat> grand finale, a little more coffee for me. Transparency surveillance. So I think the way to summarize and kind of crystallize everything I've said so far is just this motto, transparency surveillance. So in the philosophy of surveillance literature, the standard definition is that surveillance is heightened attention paid because of the possibility of bad action. And I just want to point out that transparency is definitionally surveillance. It's bureaucratic surveillance, right? It's surveillance, which is the monitoring of activities to make sure they're appropriately justified. One thing we know is that surveillance destroys intimacy and privacy and creates paranoia. Now I suggest that transparency viewed as bureaucratic surveillance destroys the possibility of intimate reasons and creates a paranoia of justification, the sense that you always have to justify yourself to someone who shares no context and has no sympathy. Right. So in general, the view in surveillance, the literature on surveillance, is that surveillance can be occasionally justified, but it has a high price. So the standard view of surveillance is that surveillance is by itself harmful. It's harmful to be constantly watched and only justified in proportion to the probability of wrongdoing and the degree of consequence. And I think we should just export this. I just think we should take this and apply it to institutional transparency. It is occasionally justified with a high price and its justification. Uh, it is inherently harmful and is justified in proportion. Transparency is justified for the proportion, the probability of wrongdoing, the degree of consequence. This is why for example, I think Lots of transparency over the building of AI is highly justified because the degree of consequence is stratospheric. Okay, so one way to put, assemble everything I've been saying is that the realm of the hidden, the intuitive, the hard to state and the hidden from public oversight is where bias hides and corruption flourishes, but it's also where expert skill resides, where sensitivity flourishes, and where intimacy lives, and transparency destroys all of this together. Right, it's a blunt instrument. The current tendency is to think that transparency is wholly good and think the more transparency, the better. What we should actually think is that transparency is a very intrusive form of bureaucratic surveillance that profoundly limits expertise and sensitivity. We do need transparency to expose bias and corruption, but we also need to trust and not demand transparency sometimes to let expertise, sensitivity, and intimacy flourish. It's another way to put it. The world is radically hyper-specialized and most domains of expertise are not directly accessible to most people. We need to trust, but because of the inaccessibility problem, the trust can't be fully secured within our own understanding. As Nut Byer puts it, trust puts us in a position of essential vulnerability. So one response we could take to the problem of vulnerability and trust is to try to eliminate the vulnerability and to rein in the experts and bring them into our site. But that imposes on them a limitation of being justificatory limited by the understanding of non-experts. I mean, in other words, I think the, the fantasy of intellectual autonomy, this Cartesian fantasy, is false. And regimes of total transparency write this institutional fantasy into public culture and public policy. And what's the solution? Um, I don't really think there is one. I think the trust and transparency are both important. They arise from the hyper-specialized nature of human knowledge and their intention, and we just choose where the slider goes between trusting experts and reining them in. And in every situation for different reasons, we have to put in a painful compromise about where we want to stand trading off between trust and transparency. That's it. Thank you.